Hello, and thank you for joining in the latest Doherty Roundtable Talk. Today's video will be discussing analytic-enabled organizations. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the rest of our participants. Shannon, let's start with you. Hi, my name is Shannon Moore. I'm a principal consultant at Doherty Business Solutions. My primary focus is data governance strategy as well as metadata management. Thank you, Shannon. Douglas? Sure. I'm Douglas Briggs. I'm a principal consultant and I co-lead Doherty's data strategy and governance competency area. Thank you, Douglas. Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Vincistine, also a principal consultant here at Doherty. Um, I am a co-leader of our visual analytics competency here at Doherty. Thanks, Jim. And I'm Joe Strano. I'm a, an also a principal consultant, a project manager currently, but I have a, a vast a, a background of data. So that's where my interest is in here as well. So before we begin, I'd like to start with the basics. Can somebody give me a two minute definition of what an analytic enabled organization is? Uh, sure, I'll give a, I'll take a swing at that. I'm not sure it'll be two minutes, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, you know, in one sense, it's actually easier to describe an analytics enabled organization by how it acts rather than what they do specifically. One of the common factors in AEOs is their capabilities around data are a competitive advantage to them in the marketplace. Really, no matter what it is that they sell or what service they offer, uh, no matter how it is they provide value in the world, the way they go about it is supported and facilitated and enabled by the good use of data. And one thing I want to be clear about is that this isn't about having the right KPIs, driving performance, or the best data scientists on staff, uh, because lots of companies have thoughtful KPIs, they have brilliant data scientists, but that doesn't make them a great AEO. Instead, it's really about a pervasive organizational culture that uses data consistently, robustly, comprehensively. Um, and in, in AEOs, people are hungry to sink their teeth into data and understand what it can tell them. Data may not be the only thing they that their job is about. Data may not be the only thing that their job is about. And in fact, for most people, it won't be. But they wouldn't dream of doing their job without it. And what's more, anytime people in an analytics-enabled organization make a decision or develop a strategy or prepare a play in the market, before they do it, they find the data and the analytic methods that will help them the most. That analysis may not be the only factor in their decision, but it's always a factor. That's what sets AEOs apart, really the behavior and the attitude. So let's, uh, Jim, Shannon, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think of it in, I think if I were had to sum up what Douglas just said in like a sentence, like what's a definition in a sentence, it, it's an organization where everyone, every single person is aware and confident in how they can leverage analytics in their role, right? It's like, I understand how my role relates to data and analytics. What's so my relationship with it? How can I use it? to accomplish the things I have to do in support of the organization's goals and my team's goals. Um, but it really, be, it, it becomes very introspective. Like how can I as a person get what I need and leverage it uh, in support of the broader organizational goals? And along those lines, um, Jim does a lot with data literacy. And I think a big piece of an analytics enabled organization is that individuals feeling confident and comfortable, not just on the, the IT and data side of the house, but, but broadly across the organization. I personally did not originally come from a computer science or engineering or development background. I come from actually a humanities background. So that whole idea of feeling comfortable with data, knowing enough about data to confidently talk about it and and push back when, when maybe we think there's a problem. I think many people in the business side of the house don't have that kind of confidence, even if they maybe have some of the skills. Hmm. And I think a big piece of the analytics enabled organization is enough literacy and confidence across the board that people, people can have those conversations and, and feel confident enough to have those conversations. So after listening to all that, I might be tempted to say that um, this would be an organization that allows their that allows data driven decisions. So, what's the difference between data driven and analytic enabled? I'll start with that. So, so I think we've talked about this before. Of of me as a user, I 
again, coming from sort of the background I have, I don't like the idea of data driving me, you know, data driving me can mean, you know, it's whipping me with a stick or it can mean it's got the steering wheel and I'm not in charge. And so I think the difference of the analytics enabled is data is enabling me to make more thoughtful, intelligent, useful, helpful business value decisions as opposed to data pushing me down a path and, and I don't feel like I'm in control. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I like the, the the phrasing of analytics enabled resonates with me differently than data driven does, right? Analytics is where value gets realized from data, right? Data by itself is just sort of a thing and it has some value, but it only has value when you engage it with some other process. And, you know, analytics is where the value is realized from data. So like even just starting there with analytics instead of data starts to separate I think the difference in, in these in these two terms, um, and then enabled against driven, right? Like to Shannon's point, like nobody f nobody likes to feel like they're just being blindly driven by by this. And the language of enabled sort of recognizes the value of human intuition and experience and context mm -hmm. when you apply analytics in your decision making. So it it really does when you when you think about it in those sort of the language that we're choosing, the terms that we're choosing, it starts to feel different. Yeah, the the part about this that I really felt resonated for me was uh the real acknowledgement um in the difference that data is agnostic. Uh, and that this agnostic thing driving the organization is different than analytics enabling the success of the organization or enabling the the organization to achieve its goals. Analytics are are understanding and insight and outcome focused, and that's really the uh, to me the differentiator between the two of them. That it's not about the the kind of agnostic asset. It's really about uh, the insights that they that they generate and making them enabled versus driving is is very much what Shannon talked about that it's not a uh, it's not a kind of directed activity that it's something that's supportive instead of uh, prescriptive or um, or uh, demanding. Along those lines of that and notion of not being prescriptive, but but helping and 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 moving things along positively. One aspect of an analytics enabled organization is data governance. And oftentimes data governance very much has this perception of it's this thing they're making me do. I don't really understand it. I don't really see any value, know what the value is to it. Right. So so it's just a, a hassle at best and at worst a, a hindrance. And one of the things that we've we've made a big effort with our efforts in analytics enabled organizations at various clients is to talk about why we're doing this. What's the value of data governance? How does that help create business value? How does knowing what do I have? Where is it? Can I trust it? How that helps the organization more broadly to 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 achieve their goals and to move beyond from a data governance perspective, move beyond data governance as being this thing that IT and data teams mandate to it's a business mindset of how we think I don't buckle up my seatbelt because I'm worried about getting a ticket. I buckle up my seatbelt because I want to be safe and it's the smart thing to do and it's 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 good for me. And it's part of what we're doing in the data governance space is trying to move data governance beyond data teams to the business more broadly. All right. So, so given that, let's let's segue into uh, talking about what are some of the benefits that an organization might realize by reorienting to analytic enabled organization. Um, I I think it'll be. I say how do, how do I want to say this? But it, I, I think when when companies start to focus on trying to be data driven, which has been a big sort of buzzword for the last for the last few years, um, then you start to spin into this idea of culture, right? And like what what's my culture how, and I'm going to be a data driven culture but nobody really knows how to do that because culture is sort of a byproduct of a bunch of people <laughs> sort of rallying around a common goal of yes. how they're going to use data or, or do things differently right so like setting a I'm going to be a data driven culture as your goal is really really hard to hit because culture sort of naturally occurs 
versus something that you can say, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go change this. Um, but the way it naturally occurs and the, the way that we think about AEO is we focus on people, process, and technology in that order, right? When you say, I'm going to be data-driven, it's often, I'm going to start with technology and just assume the other stuff will follow. Um, the concept of analytics-enabled organization recognizes that we ought to change the people first, right? We have to get to the folks like Shannon who are terrified by this, you know, who are terrified by this idea of being data-driven and it's like, data is not my thing. I'm not a math person. Like if we start there and try to solve the problem there and address data literacy gaps and some of that awareness and confidence um, and also connecting people to data through catalogs and good governance practices. But it's like, you can do this. Here are ways you can do it. Here are ways you can connect and engage. Um, you can, when you do it that way and you start in that order, you can kind of succeed with almost any technology. You know, Douglas said data is agnostic. Technology is pretty agnostic too. You can right. take a variety of tools here if you get the people in process right. Organizational change management, that culture piece is a big piece of an analytics enabled organization and, and developing, uh, you know, whether it's a tool adoption, but but more broadly, that understanding of, of how to use data and use it more effectively, you know, awareness. Do people do people know what needs to change? Do they want to change? Do they have the knowledge to know how to do things differently? Then do they feel comfortable? I think that's a piece we often skip skip, particularly if we're implementing, say, a data catalog or something. Uh, oftentimes, I think the step of well, we've taught them how to do it, so like, what's people's problem? Well, oftentimes it's that uh, that fifth piece of ADCAR, the ProSci model of I know how to do it, but also I have ability. I feel comfortable and confident doing it and then re reinforcing that. So, so you know, pro OCM principles are, are really interesting to apply to an analytics enabled organization scenario because the focus of OCM is the people side of change. And that's really the starting point for, for AEO. Um, the part about this that I really enjoyed uh, thinking about was that, you know, in my description of AEOs and and what they are, what they look like, what they uh, kind of the how they do things, um, it's very culture and uh, attitude focused. However, as Jim said, you, you can't simply design that, that that's really an outcome. And instead, we have to move we have to get that as a result through a kind of methodical and very thoughtful set of activities that we design with an organization to get them there. And part of that is the change management. Part of that is the, the technology adaptations that they need to make so that they have the right set of tools to accomplish it. And then the last piece of it is the, the processes and the methods that they need to engage in, that they need to adopt in order to kind of glue all of the pieces together. So I, I very much appreciated the, the different aspects of this. So, so basically what you're saying is that this really isn't just a technology problem, right? It's not just a case of right, but like just buying the right tool. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. Uh, if it were, if it were simply a case of there being some particular technology that will make you an analytics enabled organization, well, we just tell you what it is and tell you to go get it. But, but truthfully, it's, it's not a silver bullet that there are certainly technologies that make aspects of analytics easier to accomplish that makes them uh, more accurate, makes them uh, faster or uh, more efficient for an organization. But it's not about that. There are plenty of AEOs that could do what they need to do with Excel and with very simple tools because they have because they have people who are very skilled and who know what to do, who are excited to use analytics to solve their problems and who have good processes to support them in doing that. And then the technology is whatever they need it to be. And a piece of that too, too, is that that leadership piece or that leadership having an aligned strategy. It's as we go and work with different clients, you know, we've seen some clients where at, at 
from the CEO level, you know, we are changing direction. We want everybody to get on board. And, and, and there was widespread understanding of kind of why it was important for the organization. We've seen the opposite of that. And it's interesting. We've also seen organizations where they may not necessarily have a lot of data governance maturity, or they have inconsistent processes, or they've never had a formalized process really at all. Everything's really kind of ad hoc. Yet their desire and their their desire from leadership across the board, kind of senior on down, is is very much, hey, we we want to do this, we want to understand, we want to improve and and an openness to it that that really helps to set the stage for some dramatic improvements. So that leadership align having a strategy and aligning leadership around that is another important piece, like Douglas mentioned. Right. Yeah, that's a big important part of the change, right? Like Douglas said, you can you can succeed with a lot of tools as long as you have the skills and you have an environment supported by leadership that sort of lets you feel empowered to do the things that you want to do, like to do new things, to try new things, to to break some stuff, right? Like, like that is the way that analytics kind of works. Sometimes we have to we have to connect the things. We got to try something new. Sometimes we break it, right? Sometimes things they don't go the way that we want. They want we want them to, but we have to have you have to have a, an environment where leadership is like, hey, yeah, cool, right? Like I worked at a, a previous company where one of the sort of awards, like, like a quarterly award that the uh, the CEO at the time gave out was for glorious failure. Like, <laughs> yeah, and it, it was great. Like, we, we, you, you could earn this award, the glorious failure award for the quarter because you went and tried something that was new, that was out on the edge, and maybe it didn't go the way you wanted to, but it wasn't worthless, right? We, we learned something <laughs> and something, yep. and it was like, but it, it really just created this culture where it's like, cool, I'm going to go try this thing that we've never tried before yes. because mm. I feel empowered to do it. And that's a really big part of this is you, like I as a person had to be confident that I could try this thing and go do it and also rec- realize that I would be recognized and rewarded even if it didn't work, right? Like even if it didn't work the way I thought it might, mm. that's okay, right? But again, those are, those aren't technology problems. Those are human people and process kinds of problems. Well, that reminds me of a conversation that I had with one of our other consultants who, who's at a client right now in the process of working on a data catalog. And there was discussion around, do we let people just kind of put things in the catalog or do we lock it down? And only after everything's been 100% approved and final and, and what if we get what if we get conflicting information in the catalog and his response to that was if we get conflicting information in the catalog then that's a really great opportunity for us to discuss what should the right thing be and so he saw that as real positive if there was maybe some as opposed to i think oftentimes like well there's we got two things in there and they're different ah you know he was like no that that bubbles up all the things we're trying to bubble up with data governance yeah right it 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 goes to the progress over perfection right like idea and how do we how do we do this so i mean back to the the technology question i think that you originally asked joe like i remember working with a leader in it who in his description they had built this great car right they had, they had built this environment where people could self serve and they had data and they had environments and they had thought through a lot of the governance practices and he's like, so we've got this great car and it just sits in the garage. Mm. Um, and they had sort of ignored the fact that they might have a whole pool of business users who didn't know how to drive the manual transmission sports car that they had built. Right. And they, people needed a little bit of driver's ed. And it wasn't it was never part of their their plan or their implementation or their rollout. And once we got them to kind of pivot their thinking and start to think more about well, how, like, how do you teach the behavior? How do you sit with someone and show them how this is going to help them that they really started to sort of get the, the change that they were hoping for. Um, but those happen, like, that's a lot of like really brute force kind of work. It's sitting with one person or one team and kind of helping them. And then you have to go and do it again and you have to do it again and you have to do it again so that you can sort of build this snowball of momentum. Right. Right. So that's a good point, Jim. I really like that because what we're talking about is not an analytics enabled person 
or an analytics enabled team. Right. It's an analytics enabled organization. And that by essentially building a sports car and teaching the very best drivers you've got how to drive it, but no one else, or um, you're building a Formula One racer and then hiring hiring the driver because, well, but they may they may have a nice time with it, but no one else will. Really, it's about making sure that everyone in the organization knows how to use the data, the analytics, the methods that are right for their job to make the best decisions, to do their job in the best way that they possibly can, to have that insight to inform their work activity. And it's going to differ across the organization. An analytics-enabled CEO's decision is going to be different than the analytics enablement, the kind of skills and tools and methods uh, that a business analyst may need in, in the marketing organization or in logistics. And that's okay. That's the way it ought to be. However, the, the common thread is that everyone has that. Everyone has that at whatever level or whatever uh, activity constitutes their work right yeah i like that point douglas and it, it is the way that we tend to approach data literacy when we when we approach it with a client is it's like this is for everyone even your formula one race car driver data scientist has some elements that they have to that they have to learn because you know literacy we think when we hear literacy we think about language and communication and and you know it tends to be reading and writing but it's like yeah, does, 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 does that race car driver data scientist of yours understand how to communicate with someone who's brand new to this? Yes. And do you, like, do you understand how to find common ground, <laughs> find common language and make sure that you're, you're saying the same thing and you're hearing it and interpreting it the same way? Um, and that's where like literacy is for everyone. Everyone sort of has yep. gaps that they can fill mm -hmm. uh, to make that conversation more fluid. And that's you know, the outcome of that is some of that confidence that Shannon has been talking about. Yeah, and sometimes we hear, you know, so what, are you, what does analytics enable me? We're trying to make data scientists of everyone. It's like, no, that's not the intent of it. It, it really is about the experts being able to communicate and, and, and speak and teach effectively to people who are not as expert in using data and vice versa, people who are less expert in using data developing more skills and abilities so that they can meet somewhere in the middle and, and have intelligent decisions and make good business decisions around it based on data. Right. Yeah, it's aware and confident of the, the relationship you have with analytics in your role. Mm -hmm. So you've been, when you're around IT long enough, you realize that a lot of different shiny objects appear across the horizon, <laughs> right? So, yes. so why is an analytic enabled organization important and not just another one of the little shiny objects that appear every once in a while? Um, well, I, yeah, I think we kind of have hit on that a little bit all, along the way here, right? It's, it's, it's about like a big fundamental shift in how people leverage things, right? And Douglas made this point very well a few minutes. If, if there was one technology that would solve this problem, like we would just be top level partners with them and we would sell it to our clients and all would be great, right? And we wouldn't be here having a conversation with differing opinions and stuff about it um, because it's it's not a technology problem, I think is, is really the, the most direct point I can put on it is the, the changes, the struggles people have. And we see clients who struggle with all sorts of technology stacks. They struggle with the same problem because the technology is the last part of it. And it's comparatively the easiest part of it to solve. You can choose um, any mixture of technology that kind of works with you and fits your priorities if you get the people and process part right. Um, and that's where sometimes if it's really heavy handed IT driven, it's gets so focused on technology and maybe it spills into process, but we've kind of, we've fallen into that. I built the car and nobody wants to drive it problem because you ignored the people. <laughs> and um, so we're, we like to go at it with clients by flipping that on its head and saying, you have, this is a people thing. Let's start with the people, build processes that make sense to the people, it's technology that supports the processes for what the people need to do. Right. But it's, this is a people thing. It's an organizational change. It's a human change. You got to get people kind of thinking and working differently. 
Yeah, the, the one thing that I would say about why this is not simply another uh, buzzword, simply another kind of topic to follow, uh, is that we're seeing a really fundamental shift in, in our culture because data has become so pervasive. There's so many devices that gather data about us that, that we have access to our own data, that there's an opportunity for us in our, in our non-business lives to have access to all kinds of information and being able to use that and draw conclusions from it to, to gain insights from it, to, to change behaviors based on what we come to understand from it is becoming an increasingly fundamental need and expectation for everyone that the you know information my watch tells me about my sleep patterns uh, is something that I can use to make choices about my health or to to make changes in the way I sleep and this this kind of nascent shift in uh, awareness around data and around capabilities around data is something that we now can translate into this business context to say this capability here everybody is really on the cusp of being able to understand and develop here's how you apply it in a business setting and this is the value that you're going to get when you embrace it yeah the, what, what douglas said about the i think the volume of data that we all have to deal with in our personal lives and at work is a big part of why aeo is not just a buzzword i mean used to be data driven let's just get more data right it's like right. no now we're being buried alive in data right. Right? so it really is yep. about data volume is such a piece of why analytics enablement is is really becoming more and more critical mm -hmm. So data literacy is a life skill is what you just said, Douglas, right? I think so. That's much, yeah. Yeah. much better said, much more yeah. concise than mine. Thank you. <laughs> That's really true. <laughs> after watching all of this and after hearing everything that's been said, I, I decided my organization needs to move toward becoming an analytic enabled organization. What's the first step? Well, I, I guess I'll start with that and, and give the the canned consultant answer of it depends, right? Like where <laughs> where we live, our headspace as consultants is often living in answering questions that are that the best answer for is it depends, right? Because um, you know, as we've talked about a lot, is there there's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot of different ways that a lot of different ways that you might have to change and succeed and different things you might have to address um, to kind of get yourself going down this path. And every organization is in a different place that way, right? So to go back to my, we built this car example, like where they needed to start was on this people side, right? They had, they had thought about, they had pretty good stuff for the other two parts. Um, they just had not paid any attention at all to the people side. Um, if you're if, if you're like really immature and just like, we don't really use data at all, then we may take an approach or we probably would take an approach that's a bit more holistic and say like, well, let's teach people while we're building processes, um, you know, and, and and let's decide on your tech stack, right? Like we could do all of those parts in, in order, but where you start really depends on what you're already good at and what's really important to you, right? Like how do you define what success is but you know, especially in the short term, and then we can sort of focus our efforts on that. It's like we built the car. Success now is getting the car to the garage. Cool. Well, then we have to focus on coaching and literacy and those kinds of things versus like, hey, we just hired a whole new army of analysts, but they don't have any access to data. They don't <laughs> they don't know how to find anything. We don't have systems meant for business people to access data. Like that's a different problem then I already have all that stuff in place and people just don't know how to use it. So that's what I think is it, it depends on where you are and what you're already good at. Um, my particular thought on this is really that um, an organization that's looking at this really does need to understand what their capacity is for change. Uh, this is ultimately going to be something that impacts the entire organization. And as we work with many of our clients, we have to help assess and help the leadership that often is driving this kind of change to understand where is this going to take root first where is this going to have success and adoption first and where is it going to be 
more difficult, whereas it's going to have more uh, more struggle and more resistance because it's often impossible to to kind of lift the entire organization all at once immediately. And so really an organization's self-awareness around their capacity for a change of this magnitude is very important. And a maturity assessment is often a really logical place where we start simply because there are so many things that you, one, there's so many thing, possible things you could do. Two, uh, maturity level may vary from department to department or group to group. And, and prioritization of those is is another thing. So there's 48 things we could do. What should we do first? And getting some consensus and understanding around that. So assessment, maturity assessment is often the place that we start, but it's not the only place to start. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So I'd like to thank Douglas, Shannon, and Jim for participating in this roundtable, and thank you for joining us. We truly appreciate your time and hope that you found this conversation insightful. Please stay tuned for the next roundtable presented by Doherty Business Solutions. Have a wonderful day.